In this lecture, we'll be covering fermentation and gluconeogenesis. And on the title slide, I've shown um, a couple uh, applications, I guess you could say, of fermentation uh, that we'll be talking about, depending on whether you're uh, a microorganism like a yeast or an animal like, like we are. Okay, so last time we covered glycolysis um, and certain feeder pathways into glycolysis. What we're going to be talking about in this lecture uh, comes from 14.3, which is fermentation. I'll mention a little bit about biofuels, which really isn't covered in the text, um, just very briefly. Uh, and then section 14.4 covers gluconeogenesis, which is kind of like glycolysis in reverse. Um, sort of there's a few few workarounds that we'll we'll discuss uh, and then we'll also cover at the end of this lecture the pentose phosphate pathway uh, which is sort of like using glucose as a building block um, that'll be uh, just very brief okay so I remind you uh, the fates of pyruvate so in glycolysis we have uh, glucose going to pyruvate and that's through the, the 10 reactions of glycolysis. Okay, from there, pyruvate has a, a number of different fates depending on whether or not uh, oxygen is available. So if there is uh, plenty of oxygen available and, and there's an energy need, pyruvate will go uh, get broken down further into acetyl-CoA, and then that gets fed in the citric acid cycle um, to make carbon dioxide and water. Okay, and then that, uh, that generates electrons for the respiratory chain. Okay, that's under aerobic conditions. When there isn't oxygen around, the, the fates uh, of pyruvate can be different depending on what organism uh, you're, you're talking about. In things like um, animals like us, during those uh, anaerobic or hypoxic conditions, pyruvate will be converted into lactate or lactic acid. Uh, this, in microorganisms like yeast, this, this process, uh, a similar process when there is an oxygen, pyruvate gets converted into ethanol, and, and that's what's known as fermentation. Okay? The process of pyruvate going to lactate in humans, uh, you can also call that uh, fermentation as well. So remember, think back to glycolysis, and in step, step number six of glycolysis, glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate is converted into 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. And this was done by an enzyme called glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate dehydrogenase. Okay. And if you remember, that enzyme is using NAD cofactor and converting it into NADH. That NADH then gets fed into the respiratory chain under aerobic conditions. And we'll talk more about this um, in Chapter 19. But that NADH is then the, the main uh, source of electrons for the respiratory chain. Okay, so then NADH uh, donates its electrons through complex 1, and then there's a, you know, a big shuttle from that to complex 3 and, and complex 4. Uh, and, and that's what drives this, uh, the electron transfer is what drives the protons being pumped. Uh, and then the proton gradient is what drives the formation of ATP. Okay, so that's um, just a little preview of what we're going to be covering in chapter 19. But that, that makes this uh, reaction, step six in glycolysis, coupled with, with uh, aerobic um, metabolism in, in that respiratory chain. Okay, when no oxygen is present, so this requires, this electron transfer requires there to be oxygen as the ultimate electron acceptor. And when no oxygen is present, this electron transport chain stops. Okay, that's, okay, that's all well and good, but what happens to glycolysis? If, if NAD keeps getting um, turned into NADH by glycolysis, Pretty soon, the concentration of NAD8, and, and you can't you can't uh, recycle it back to NAD if there's no oxygen. Pretty soon, the concentration of NADH will will get 
you know, really high and the concentration of, of the NAD will get lower, right? And if you remember that the NAD is a substrate for this enzyme, okay, and if you're lowering that concentration of a substrate, pretty sure that pretty soon that's going to change the delta G uh, of this reaction. Uh, and this reaction won't go forward anymore. It'll, it'll start going, um, you know, reverse and, and actually be in equilibrium, which would not be a very good good thing that would stop glycolysis. So the cell needs another way of, of recycling NADH uh, when this happens, when there's no oxygen. Okay. And that's where uh, this term fermentation comes into play. Okay. Basically, in, in anaerobic conditions, you're running glycolysis, you need to keep that, that central pathway going. So the generation of, of energy, or ATP, um, is going without uh, con consuming oxygen or a, a net consumption of NAD+. Okay. When you go through glycolysis to pyruvate, right, that, that gives you pyruvate, um, then pyruvate, when there's no oxygen, needs to be converted into another product. Okay. And that conversion of pyruvate to another product is what's going to regenerate the NAD+, plus for further glycolysis. The process, as we'll see in the next slide, is used to produce a number of different um, food, uh, food items and, and also um, uh, chemicals. Okay. So there's this, you, don't, you don't need to memorize any of these organisms, um, but just be aware that there's, there's different fates for the pyruvate, at, pyru, pyruvate or pyruvic acid depending on what organism you're, you're looking at, okay? But all of them uh, are doing this for the same reason. They're converting, uh, during glycolysis, you're, you're, conver you're making NADH. When there's no oxygen around, that NADH has to be recycled back to NAD plus to keep glycolysis uh, going, okay? So there's things like um, uh, propionic acid, in Swiss cheese, uh, uh, lactic acid, um, very similar to animals, um, but some microorganisms also produce lactic acid, and examples of those are um, the microorganisms in, in cheddar cheese or yogurt or, or soy sauce. Um, yeast, um, I think that's probably the most well-known uh, application of fermentation is to produce uh, ethanol. Okay, things like wine and beer. Uh, there's also microorganisms that can produce acetone and isopropanol, you know, very, what we'd consider kind of harsh chemicals, but that's, you know, that's what they're converting pyruvate into. And then finally, uh, things uh, can produce acetic acid as well. All right. So animals, they undergo lactic acid fermentation. Okay. So the pyruvate is uh, reduced to lactate, which is a reversible process, okay? And this usually you can think of um, happening during strenuous exercise. Okay? Lactic acid or lactate builds up in the muscle, okay? and that really kind of puts a limit onto the time that you can do like a, a, an all-out maximum effort. It, it's generally about a minute is what they say, okay? Um, the acidification of muscle prevents that continuous, strenuous work from, from continuing longer than that. All right. How we get around this or how we can recover from this is that lactate is transported from the muscle to the liver and, con and converted back to glucose there. Okay. That does require some recovery time. Uh, during that time, high amounts of oxygen is consumed to, to fuel gluconeogenesis, uh, and that is what restores muscle, muscle glycogen stores. Okay, and that's called the Cori cycle, which we'll, we'll talk about here uh, in a little bit. Okay. This is just uh, from my Strava, um, kind of like a real-world example of this. Uh, it's a on a segment that was, it's a little bit less than a minute, 50 seconds, 50 some seconds, uh, 50 seconds, there it is. Um, but 
it, it kind of illustrates this idea of about a minute is about as long as you can can go all out for so in this this time i was averaging you know 600 600 watts for for this time and you know by the end it really starts to drop okay because there you simply can't can't keep keep going because you're you're getting uh, too much lactic acid buildup okay so what are what are the the chemical the biochemical steps of fermentation uh, in in animals Okay, so pyruvate is going to be converted to, to lactic acid or lactate. Okay. And it's done, this is done by an enzyme called lactate dehydrogenase. Okay, very simple, right? Um, lactate, it, it's telling you that it, it's an enzyme that um, can, can oxidize or reduce uh, lactate. Okay, it's really an enzyme that's probably named for the reverse step. Um, but in this case, in fermentation, we're, we're talking about it going in, in the opposite direction. Uh, so what's happening, and normally a dehydrogenase, you would take that substrate and, and a oxidized cofactor, and you would oxidize the substrate and reduce that cofactor, right? So that'd be the reverse reaction. But, but in this case, it, the biological function is the opposite direction. And so what the enzyme's really doing is, is converting pyruvate to lactate. And you see that they're very similar molecules. They're both three carbons. Okay. Pyruvate has that, that carbonyl group at carbon two. Lactate has an alcohol. Okay. So it's being, uh, being reduced. And NADH, the reduced cofactor, is being oxidized to NAD+. And the delta G for this reaction is, is you know, very, very negative. Okay, so the equilibrium lies um, far to the right. Okay. This is a, a redox uh, reaction. Okay, so what's going on uh, if, if we look, why is this occurring? Well, in, in glycolysis, glucose going to pyruvate, you're, you're creating NADH. If you're not using that via aerobic uh, metabolism uh, or aerobic the, the respiratory chain you need a way to convert that so pyruvate going to lactate that is recycling your nadh into nad plus okay and so this this is just another figure another way of of looking at it like that okay you're what you're doing here um is recycling your nad Well, it, you might think, okay, so if you if you keep doing this right, um, that's not necessarily good because you're going to get this huge buildup of, of lactic acid and, and you're going to have no glucose left. And that's where this Cori cycle comes into play. So in the muscles, that's where this will be occurring, um, this fermentation, right? Your, your glycogen and ultimately glucose is being converted um, to lactate. Uh, under those anaerobic conditions. Okay, you need a way to recycle that, and so your bloodstream will carry the lactate to the liver. In the liver, you convert lactate back into glucose, and then the, the glucose then flows back into the muscles where it's needed. Okay, so that, again, that's the Cori cycle. Okay, in, the, in the liver, it uses ATP used in the synthesis of, of glucose. Okay, so that... Um, sort of puts a limit on to you know how long this you can can do this without without having another way of, of gaining energy okay. so that's that's uh, animals in yeast this occurs via a different product and that's ethanol and, and in yeast this is actually uh, a two-step process instead of a one-step process okay so um when i say yeast we're really talking about the um, uh, Saccharomyces Saccharomyces um, uh, species uh, of yeast. Okay. And again, this is a two-step reduction of pyruvate to ethanol. Uh, it's an irreversible process.
as humans, we don't have one of the enzymes, the first enzyme in this process, pyruvate decarboxylase. Uh, we do, however, have the second enzyme, which is alcohol dehydrogenase, which actually allows us to, to consume ethanol. All right, and the first, the first step of this reaction, carbon dioxide is produced, okay, and that's what gives carbonation or beer carbonation. Um, it's also what it is responsible for dough rising when you're, when you're baking bread, okay. Okay, both steps require cofactors, pyruvate decarboxylate, and the first step requires a magnesium ion uh, as a cofactor, as well as something called thiamine pyrophosphate, that's abbreviated as TPP, um, a a as another cofactor. And we'll, we'll, we'll show what that looks like here in a second. Okay, the, the second step, alcohol alcohol dehydrogenase. It's a dehydrogenase, so it, it uses um, NADH. So that first step here, uh, pyruvate, is converted into uh, acetaldehyde. Um, the acetaldehyde uh, is a... Um, pyruvate's a three-carbon molecule it loses a CO2 and then acid aldehydes a, a two carbon molecule that's left from that. Okay, so if pyruvate decarboxylase, um, that enzyme name tells you what it's doing. It's taking pyruvate and it's taking off a CO2. Okay, so CO2 is removed uh, by pyruvate decarboxylase. That gives you acid aldehyde. Acid aldehyde then is converted into ethanol by alcohol dehydrogenase. And that's what recycles the NADH back to NAD+. Right. So this is uh, ethanol fermentation is allowing glycolysis to continue. So you have glycolysis here producing ATP, uh, and then it's, it's converting NAD to NADH. Then you can take pyruvate to acid aldehyde, acid aldehyde to ethanol, and that recycles your NADH back to NAD. So that allows you to keep uh, glycolysis occurring and keep uh, ATP production going. Okay, so biofuels actually utilize uh, this process of fermentation in microorganisms to produce things like ethanol or other hydrocarbons that can be used as fuels. Okay. Feedstocks from plant material, uh, generally those are plant material that contain, you know, cellulose or sometimes algae are used for this. Okay, and that's where they're considered renewable because these feedstocks of plant material or algae can grow with minimal input of outside energy, okay? So they, they really um, require, you know, primarily sunlight to grow these, these things. Okay. The microorganisms can be engineered to maximize the production of your, your target or produce even some non-native compounds. So what, if I'd ask you a question about uh, biofuels, this is probably the most important information to remember, just the process of, of getting a biofuel. Okay, so the first uh, step here is you have to harvest uh, what's known as biomass. So whatever your, your feed material is, whether it's, you know, plant-based or algae-based, you have to harvest that, okay? And then that biomass has to be um, processed so that the, the cellulose, the, the, the molecule that you're trying to break down in the fermentation process is, is exposed um, to, to the enzymes that will be in the next step. Okay, so in this case, by, uh, in this figure, it says biomass is cut into shreds and pre-treated with heat and chemicals. Okay. The next step is enzymes acting on, uh, in, in this example, it's cellulose. So enzymes are, are chewing up the cellulose and breaking it into individual sugars, okay? Those individual sugars are then uh, fed in the next step to microbes to ferment 
this uh, into, in this case, it's ethanol. Okay, so this is, uh, step four is the fermentation process, making your target molecule, using fermentation to make your target molecule. Okay, and then the, in the last step, okay, that, that molecule that you've made, you generally are going to have to um, distill it and purify it uh, before it, it can be used um, uh, industrially. There's some novel ways to break down cellulose, and this is an example of one. Um, you're not going to be responsible for this on an exam, uh, but uh, you can use things like nanoparticles and then uh, put a, a enzymes, immobilize enzymes on these nanoparticles that, that can, can first break down the cellulose and then the, the nanoparticles magnetic so you can you can remove the nanoparticles from the from the tank um, fairly easily and recycle them and reuse them. Uh, this figure shows the fuel ethanol production okay and this is a little bit a little while ago from 2012 but you get the kind of the idea here uh, each country how much they produce in billions of liters and then kind of an example of what their their um, feed stock is so in in the u.s it's generally corn to make ethanol um they're you know brazil here that's i think that's sugar cane so they're in, in indonesia i don't know if those are beets something like that so they're different places in, in different parts of the world can use different um, crops. And one thing I will say about this is that as more crops are used and crop space is used for producing fuels, it does tend to drive up the price of, of food as well because, you know, there's less acreage uh, available to, to produce food. So that's one of the unintended uh, consequ consequences, I guess you could say, of biofuels. Another problem with uh, specifically ethanol used as a fuel is that when you use ethanol or add ethanol to gasoline, you create more ozone um, from the burning of that, uh, especially when the, the temperature's, you know, over uh, 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, so that's just one of those um, unintended consequences again of you know trying to use something that's more um, greener a greener fuel a more renewable fuel but uh, there are you know drawbacks to it as well okay and then this table is is kind of interesting it just shows you from 2004 to 2013 the how how much the production of of ethanol uh, increased, especially in the United States. Okay, um, it it went up quite a bit during that time. I'm not off the top of my head. I, I'm not sure if it, it has continued to go up it, or if it's sort of leveled off. Okay. Another aspect of biofuels, um, you know, if if you want ethanol, that's that's fairly easy to do because there's uh, yeast that can that just naturally make ethanol but another thing you can do is engineer microorganisms to produce either more of the the thing that they naturally make or you can also add in genes to them and block block the genes that they have some of the genes they have and add others in to make specific uh, other specific fuels so this is an example of, of that case so we have, uh, and you don't have to memorize this for an exam. Um, it's just kind of a cool example, I think. So you have glucose going to pyruvate and glycolysis. Okay, that's, you know, in every cell on the planet pretty much. Okay, then pyruvate going to acetyl-CoA. Nothing, you know, special about that. But what they've done in this or this microorganism is they've, they've, blocked the ability to create lactate they blocked the ability to create other things like succinate and formate so all of these other branches off of this these pathways they've blocked so that pushes everything into uh what is this molecule down here 
Okay, so in these genes, they've also added to this microorganism, the ones that are in italic. And, and so they've created a way to push all the glucose uh, that goes through here and, and convert it into butanol. And then the butanol can be used as a fuel, right? And they've also um, created a, a balance here. If you look at the, uh, the NADHs that are produced, there are four NADHs being produced. Uh, going through glycolysis and then pyruvate dehydrogenase. Uh, and then they use four NADHs uh, in this pathway to get to butanol. So that is also in balance. Yeah. If you're interested in renewable energies or, or you know, biofuels, uh, engineered microorganisms, there's a place called National Renewable Energy Lab, NREL, uh, out in Golden that you should look into getting, um, possibly getting an internship or, or after you graduate uh, a career if you want to work in that field. It's a, a pretty um, big, big center uh, in the country for that. Okay, moving on to gluconeogenesis. Okay. In gluconeogenesis, what, what is going on here is that you have... Um, different precursors being fed uh, into the end of glycolysis and you're running glycolysis in reverse to get out uh, carbohydrates. Okay. And so this is a figure from the book just showing, you know, the different uh, ways you can feed into this and, and work back through gluconeogenesis to get to your carbohydrates. Okay. Here's a little bit more, uh, a figure that ha has some more detail to it. Okay, so glycolysis is shown on the left in red, right? The 10 steps of that going from glucose to pyruvate, okay? Glycolysis occurs mainly in muscle and the brain, okay? Gluconeogenesis is shown on the right side in blue, okay? And in gluconeogenesis, the overall is the opposite. You're taking pyruvate and you're converting it to glucose, okay? Gluconeogenesis occurs mainly in the liver, okay? So these pathways uh, aren't going, both going at the same time in the same cell, okay? They, in, in general, you can think of it as, as occurring in different places in, in the body. Um, for something like... Um, You can, I, th I think you can also, if a cell could do both of these, they're not going to be doing both of these pathways at the same time, okay? It, it would depend on the conditions that the cell is in, whether it's using glycolysis or gluconeogenesis. Okay, here's an, just another uh, figure that shows the same information. This is, um, the previous one was from a book. This is not from our book. Um, I include it just to give you another uh, another way to look at this. Okay, and here's yet another, uh, another way of showing this information. Okay, the thing that I like about this, this has quite a bit more information, so you don't necessarily have to read all of, all of this stuff. But what this shows that I, I like is that it shows you this glycolysis is happening in the cytosol, okay? But gluconeogenesis, the, the, the conversion of pyruvate to oxaloacetate in the first step of gluconeogenesis, that has to occur in the mitochondria, okay? And then oxaloacetate gets out of the mitochondria by this, this malate aspartic acid shuttle, converted back into oxaloacetate in the cytosol, and then um, that's converted to the to PEP. Okay, so that workaround uh, in in gluconeogenesis occurs in the mitochondria, whereas glycolysis we we generally consider glycolysis as occurring all in the cytosol. Okay. These are again opposing pathways. They're both thermodynamically favorable, though. Okay, they're operating in the opposite directions, obviously. 
right, where the end product of one is the starting product of the other. Okay. Reversible reactions, you can think of the reversible reactions in glycolysis. Uh, those are going to be used by both pathways. Okay. The irreversible reactions of glycolysis have to be bypassed in gluconeogenesis, right? They're, if they're irreversible, you can't go just simply run them in reverse. So they have to be bypassed with other reactions. Okay. And other reactions means you have different enzymes, okay, which really makes these different pathways. Uh, both are highly thermodynamically favorable and they're also uh, regulated. These, these pathways, uh, these specific steps, I should say, uh, they're differentially regulated. And that is they're regulated um, with, with different uh, molecules to prevent a, um, not necessarily different molecules, but you know, if one molecule shuts one of these pathways off, it's gonna turn the other pathway on, okay? And there, that is done to prevent uh, what's known as a feudal cycle. So if, if they're both, both of these pathways are going at the same time, glycolysis and gluconeogenesis, what you're just, you're just gonna be sitting there wasting energy, All right? So the cell doesn't wanna do that. It wants to be running um, one or the other. If we look at that, the first step of gluconeogenesis, uh, it's pyruvate to uh, phospho phosphoenol pyruvate, PEP. Okay, this requires two steps and they're both energy consuming. The first step, pyruvate carboxylase, an enzyme called pyruvate carboxylase, converts pyruvate to oxaloacetate. Carboxylation uh, using a uh, this carboxylation is, is done using a biotin cofactor, uh, which is it's similar to the TPP cofactor that was in we talked about in ethanol fermentation. Okay, but you're doing the opposite. Instead of taking off a CO2, you're putting a CO2 on. Okay. And again, this requires uh, transport into the mitochondria. The second step, your PEP uh, is... is excuse me, oxaloacetate is converted to PEP. And that's by an enzyme called phosphophenol pyruvate carboxykinase. Okay. And again, this is, um, the enzyme's named a little bit maybe for the reverse reaction because it's phosphophenol pyruvate carboxykinase. This phosphorylation um, comes from GTP, which is a little bit unique. It, it, we haven't really talked about that being used, um, at least in glycolysis, right? It, it's, it's ADP and ATP, but in gluconeogenesis, we're using GTP as a, a phosphate source. Okay, and this, uh, in some organisms, this occurs in the mitochondria. Some, it, it's cytosol, so it, it's really, um, you can think of the first step as being in the mitochondria all the time. Um, this second step, it, it's dependent on the organism. So let's look a little bit closer at this. So the, the first couple steps of gluconeogenesis, right? So we have pyruvate going to oxaloacetate that takes ATP and then oxaloacetate going to uh, PEP that takes GTP. And here's a, a, just an example of this occurring in the mitochondria. There's, in reality, there's a couple different pathways uh, you can, can use for this. Um, you're not gonna be responsible for knowing these, these different pathways. Um, I'm just putting this out here because uh, it's in the book, okay? It, this is, I like this figure a little bit better because it's just a little bit simpler, but maybe, it, it doesn't show. It doesn't show this um, this pathway right going. You, it, so in this pathway, you can convert oxaloacetate directly to to PEP, and then that can be transferred outside the mitochondria. Um, in this class, we'll just focus on this pathway. 
um, where pyruvate is converted to oxaloacetate. That is then shuttled out to the cytosol to make, to make PEP. Okay. And that's done via malate shuttle. Okay. So it, it, there, it adds another step here. So the first step, uh, pyruvate is is being combined with uh, bicarbonate to form oxaloacetate, right? And that's done by an enzyme called pyruvate carboxylase or PC. Okay? Pyruvate carboxylase uses biotin, a biotin cofactor. That biotin basically grabs the the bicarbonate the co2 on bicarbonate and then moves it and sticks it on to pyruvate okay. to do that it needs energy in the form of atp okay so the reaction type here is a ligation you're sticking another molecule onto you're combining two molecules together right so it's it's ligating two molecules if we look at the mechanism uh, a little bit closer, uh, at least of the, the cofactor, so this is the biotin cofactor, okay? And what, what biotin has is kind of like a long tether to it that allows it to sort of move from side to side. So on one side, it can grab that CO2 group from bicarbonate and that loading of that, that CO2 actually is what requires the energy. Okay, then when it has that loaded, it can shift over uh, to the other active site where pyruvate comes in, and then in that, um, that enol form, it can, can attach uh, uh, CO2 to it to form oxaloacetate. The next step, we have oxaloacetate going to phosphophenol, phosphoenol pyruvate, PEP. Right. That's done using uh, an enzyme called PEP carboxykinase and GTP as a cofactor. So the CO2 can be a, a leaving group here uh, when this grabs uh, the gamma phosphate off of G GTP. Okay, what we get out is GDP, uh, CO2, that, that group leaves, that we, the group that we stuck on there just leaves again. Um, and then we're left with uh, pyruvate that has a phosphate group in the middle, right? That's phosphoenol pyruvate. Okay, this is a, a lyase reaction if you're, you're interested. Okay, so that's one bypass, okay? Um, so in that, your you, step 10 of glycolysis is, is irreversible. So you have to, in gluconeogenesis, you're bypassing that with, with two steps. So those would be step one and step two of gluconeogenesis to bypass step 10 of glycolysis. The other reverse reaction um, workaround that we need uh, are for steps one and step three of glycolysis. Those are, those are also irreversible. Okay, so let's remind ourselves what those are. So step three in glycolysis uh, would be fructose 6-phosphate going to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. So we need, uh, in, in reverse, in gluconeogenesis, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate goes to fru fructose 6-phosphate. So we need, to, we need a workaround for that. And that's with an enzyme known as fructose bisphosphatase 1, or F FBP. Okay. And the other, um, the other step, step 1 of glycolysis, would take glucose to make glucose 6-phosphate. So gluconeogenesis, we need to do that the opposite, glucose 6-phosphate to glucose. And that's done by an enzyme called glucose 6-phosphatase. Okay. So these phosphatases um, are sort of easy to remember because those are going to be the enzymes of gluconeogenesis. Okay. All right, so if we look a little bit closer here, um, and, and we're missing a step in, in here, um, that the enzymes aren't shown very well. But this would be step one, step two, and then step three. So we have to... 
work around step three and step one. Okay, so the in in reverse order, reversing step three of glycolysis here in gluconeogenesis, we're taking fructose one six bisphosphate to make fructose six phosphate, and that's done by fructose one six bisphosphatase. So phosphatase is telling you that it, it's removing a phosphate group. So you're just lobbing off that 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 phos one of the phosphate groups, uh, the one on carbon one, uh, and it's just being lost as inorganic phosphate. Right? And you're doing that again, similar similar thing. Glucose six phosphate is being converted to glucose, and you're just losing the phosphate um, as inorganic phosphate which you really don't want to do if you don't have to, right? Um, the cell is spending energy to put those on, okay? You're, to, to convert glucose to glucose 6-phosphate, you're using an ATP, right? That's one of the, the, um, the priming steps of glycolysis. So if you're, if you're just going at this in, in a cycle, let's say, and that's where the feudal cycle comes in, you're just going to be using a lot of ATP, and you're just wasting that phosphate group. It's not be it's not going to anything useful. Okay, so that would waste a lot of energy, and that's why these steps have to be uh, very carefully regulated. Okay, the reaction type for both of these, um, since we're using water to cut off the phosphate group, it's a it's a hydrolysis. These are both hydrolysis reactions. Right. So as as you probably have noticed. Gluconeogenesis is expensive. In gluconeogenesis, we have um, the cost of taking two pyruvates uh, to make a glucose. That's cost four ATPs, two, two GTPs, which you can think of as being equivalent in energy as to ATP, and also two NADHs. Okay, so it, this is an expensive process, but physiologically it, it is necessary. Okay, there's there's things like um, the brain, nervous system, and red blood cells that generate ATP only from glucose. Okay. So they need they need a way to get you know more glucose when glycogen stores are depleted. Okay, so they have to get glucose from stump somewhere. So things like you know during starvation or or really vigorous exercise, you need a way to get to get. Uh, glucose to your brain or your brain would just you know shut off okay. okay animals can produce glucose from from sugars uh, or proteins okay. the sugars uh, things like pyruvate uh, lactate oxaloacetate uh, proteins amino acids uh, can, can be converted into citric acid cycle intermediates which we talk about the citric acid cycle in chapter 16, so we haven't really seen that yet. Um, but those are known as the, the glucogenic amino acids. Right. Animals can't produce glucose straight from fatty acids. Okay, um, The product of fatty acid degradation is acetyl-CoA. Uh, you can't have a net conversion of acetyl-CoA to oxaloacetate. Okay, but some organisms like plants, yeast, and, and bacteria can can do this. They can produce glucose straight from fatty acids. Right. This is just a little um, um, preview of the citric acid cycle. You don't need to know any of this yet. Um, but this shows the different amino acids that can be fed into the citric acid cycle at, at, at given points. Okay, and we all know oxaloacetate, if you can convert any of these into oxaloacetate, right, oxaloacetate can then go into the um, gluconeogenesis. And the final thing we'll talk about in this lecture is the pentose phosphate pathway. Okay, and some of these reactions in the pentose phosphate pathway look, uh, might look a little bit um, complex, but I want to stress that I, I won't be testing um, on the nitty gritty and the you know the super detailed things uh, about the pentose phosphate pathway. I'll, I'll try to keep it to 
to be more of a, a an overview level okay so what you're doing in the pentose phosphate pathway is it's another um you when the cell has you know a lot of energy on hand uh glucose 6-phosphate it, it instead of pushing that through glycolysis it pushes it through the pentose phosphate pathway okay and in basically what you're doing is you're, you're converting glucose 6-phosphate in, in a number of steps to ribose 5-phosphate okay when you're doing that you're creating reduced cofactors NADPH okay so these these enzymes and these steps use NADP plus okay and glucose also I should mention glucose going to ribose you're losing a carbon there coming out as CO2 okay ribose 5-phosphate can be used for for nucleotides and some other coenzymes like ATP GTP those sort of things um, DNA RNA Okay, so that's kind of what that's that's good for. So in cells that that are replicating, let's say they need to, to replicate their DNA, you know, you need to do this pentose phosphate pathway to, to make your your nucleotides. Um, the other aspect, the other thing you're you're creating out of this is that reduced NADPH, and so that can be used for a, a number of different things. One of them is to convert. Uh, glutathione, uh, the oxidized glutathione, which is abbreviated here as GSSG, you can convert that back into reduced glutathione. Okay, so you have reduced NADPH, oxidized glutathione. There's a, a redox reaction. You get out oxidized NADP plus and reduced glutathione. And the the glutathione that molecule looks like this. Um, it, it, if you're interested here um, and this would be the reduced form because you have this this re reduced self-hydral here what glutathione can be used for is is uh, and we'll see this on a, on a different slide but it it's a good way of preventing oxidative damage in a cell okay. the other thing NADPH can be used for is what's known as reductive biosynthesis so things like fatty acids or sterols, um, steroids, those are synthesized um, in part using NADPH um, for, for the reduction, the reductive steps in those, the synthesis of those. Okay. So pentose phosphate pathway, again, the main products are NADPH and ribose 5-phosphate. Okay, so that's one of the important things to remember about pentose phosphate pathway. Right? And ADPH, as I said, is an electron donor in reductive biosynthesis of fatty acids and steroids. Uh, it, uh, it also can be used through glutathione to repair uh, oxidative damage. Okay, and then ribose 5-phosphate is a precursor of, of nucleotides. So DNA, RNA, and, and some, some other coenzymes use the the ribose 5-phosphate as a, as a building block. Okay. So this is a little bit more detail now of this pathway. And again, I wouldn't expect you to know um, all of these enzyme names, um, but what you're, what you're ha so there's one, two, three, four steps total here. And you have a, an enzyme called glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. All right, and so all these enzymes um, that we're talking about in, in glycolysis and gluconeogenesis, uh, now pentose phosphate pathway, they all sort of sound alike. So you're going to have to do some, some it, it takes some effort to really remember them in, in know recall which pathway they're in because they all sound you know sort of similar okay but glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase is uh, an enzyme that uses glucose 6-phosphate right that's that's after step one of glycolysis and it's it's a dehydrogenase so it's doing an oxidative reductive re reaction so it's using that 
it's it's oxidizing glucose six phosphate into um, this molecule, uh, a lactone. There's a carb. You're taking the alcohol there and, and converting it into a, a carbonyl. So you're oxidizing that, and that's what's reducing the NAD to NADP to NADPH. Okay. And then you have some other steps, um, right? So that's one of those oxidative steps. Uh, you have another step that that just you know cuts that ring, uh, and then you lose that CO2 group in the next oxidative step and make another NADPH. Okay, and that's six phosphogluconate dehydrogenase. So these two enzymes, you know, I'd probably expect you to to be able to recognize those uh, names um, because they're dehydrogenases, and this is uh, the dehydrogenase is producing the NADPHs in this this pathway. These other enzymes, I wouldn't expect you to know the names of. So it's it's actually kind of a cool process here. If you if you look at this, um, these reactions, uh, you're producing five carbon, the the ribose five phosphate, which is a five carbon sugar, but in tissues that need more NADPH than the ribose five phosphate. In an example here is liver uh, and also fat tissue. Uh, what happens is that the ribo 5 phosphate isn't very useful so there's a way to recycle it back to the glucose 6 phosphate and that's done you can see that here in this this scheme right you have two five carbon sugars you can make a seven carbon and a three carbon sugar one enzyme will do that and then the seven and the three carbon sugar um, can go fed back in that that same cycle to make a six and a four carbon Right, and that six carbon sugar is glucose six phosphate. You can then do another oxidative um, uh, pentose five that goes back into the pentose five uh, phosphate pathway to make another uh, five carbon ribose five phosphate. But but more importantly, more NADPH. Okay, so that that scheme is shown here. Okay, not going to need to to know this on an exam it's just kind of a a cool way that the body can can maximize the amount of the NADPH being produced in this pathway when the ribose 5-phosphate isn't the desired target okay. okay NADPH regulates partitioning into glycolysis versus the pentose phosphate pathway um and it's done uh in this uh, step, it, it feed it can feed back and inhibit the first step of the pentose phosphate pathway. Okay, so that that's what's known as a feedback inhibition. So if you have a high concentration of NADPH, that will feed back and inhibit that first enzyme of the pathway. So you have glucose to glucose six phosphate. That would be the first step of glycolysis. And then it can either go through glycolysis or the pentose phosphate pathway. When there's lots of NADPH around, that's fed into glycolysis. Okay, when there's no NADPH around or very little, that's when it can go into the pentose phosphate pathway. Okay, and as I mentioned, um, the NADPH can be used to to um, sort of protect against oxidative damage in the cell, okay? And this is done, again, through uh, recycling glutathione. So NADPH can be used to recycle glutathione, to reduce glutathione, which is shown here. Okay, why is that important? This is just another way of, sh of sh seeing that. So with certain things, um, even as simple as aerobic uh, respiration in the mitochondria creates what are known as, as super radicals, superoxide radicals, which then can make hydrogen peroxide and hydroxy uh, or hydroxyl free radicals. Okay. Those are all very, very damaging to the cell, especially things like uh, DNA. Uh, those, those can damage and, and um, 
um, really hurt the, the cell. So you don't want those around in very high concentrations. So this cells use uh, this molecule, glutathione, to react with these, um, these reactive oxygen species. Okay. And by doing that, the, the glutathione gets uh, ox oxidized. That's shown in this direction. So you have reduced glutathione here reacting with these reactive oxygen species to block the oxidative damage that they can do. When it does that, it gets oxidized. Okay. And so you need a way to recycle the oxidized glutathione back to reduce glutathione. Okay. And so one of the things that can do that is this NADPH. Okay. NADPH and oxidized glutathione can make NADP plus and reduce glutathione. Okay, so that's this is one of the, the uses of NADPH. Okay. In, in an enzyme uh, that does this is, is glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. Okay, right? That was that uh, first enzyme in that uh, pentose phosphate pathway that we talked about. Okay. If you have a deficiency in that enzyme, it, it can be very serious and it can even be fatal in cases of, of high oxidative stress. So a person that has a deficiency in that enzyme that is given certain drugs or exposed to you know, herbicides or even some foods, that can generate a lot of oxidative stress and, and they have no way to, to counteract that uh, or their their protection against that is greatly diminished and it can even be fatal um, if their deficiency in this enzyme is, is high enough. Uh, you see this deficiency continue on because being deficient in this enzyme uh, gives, gives these people a, a certain resistance to malaria um, because they have a high oxidative stress environment in their red blood cells. So the malaria parasite really can't live in, the, in, in them. So that's why this has been kind of passed on uh, and, and, and continues to be uh, seen in, in, in certain populations. Okay, so in summary, in, in chapter 14, uh, most importantly, I think, is glycolysis. That's the, the process which cells get energy from converting glucose to pyruvate. Okay. Um, today we talked about gluconeogenesis, which is sort of doing glycolysis in reverse uh, to, to um, get carbohydrates out of um, the feeder metabolites. And, and then also fermentation uh, being a way to continue glycolysis when you don't have oxygen around. And then finally, the, the pentose phosphate pathway, that's uh, a pathway that cr uh, produces NADPH uh, and, and ribose 5-phosphate.